Hi, James. Morning, guys. You good? I'm really good. Thanks, mate. Um, so today, the Duratus Mind podcast, a podcast born out of understanding how certain people, certain organizations achieve the successes they do. I'm just fascinated by unpicking all of that uh, and has led me on to this journey. Uh, and I'm fortunate with some of the network that I'm able to speak to. Now, James, you're someone that our paths crossed in, in my former organization. Um, I'd use the term um, performance expert in sport, business, uh, other organizations. Um, you're also more recently uh, author of uh, Accelerating Excellence. Um, okay. And I, mean, I genuinely, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, and again, for people looking on YouTube, you can see I'm a, I'm a highlighter and I'm a marker. There's literally stacks of pink pen in there. Um, mate, it was awesome. Really enjoyed it. I recommend anyone already to uh, get stuck in. And we're going to be discussing that a little bit. But mate, do you mind for the people that may not know um, yourself, James, um, sort of what your background, who you are, and how we've come to be talking today, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. I guess, I guess starting from the beginning, for as long as I can remember, I, I've just been um, fascinated with human performance. So the statistical anomalies, outliers that, you know, the perform at the upper limits of human potential, and whether that's, I think growing up reading biographies, whether that's like Sir Peter de la Villiers, you know, former commanding officers, the SAS, or, you know, your Richard Bransons, or, or, or your top athletes. It's something that just gripped me from a young age. Um, then I... Uh, was, was lucky enough to go and, and study the science. So I spent five years at the University of Edinburgh, um, understanding the mechanics that drive this process, principally excellence and expertise. Um, and, and then the last 10 to 15 years, really, I've just been privileged to be in some incredible organizations and, and taking the theory to practice and hitting it as hard as I can with the biggest metaphorical sledgehammer I could find to see what, what actually works. Um, yeah, it's just been an awesome ride, to be honest. So, obviously, we, we, we're not going to cover some of the organisations that you've worked with, but in, again, some of them are in sport. So, do you mind talking about some of the teams that you've worked with, particularly in sport? Yeah, so in, in advisory cap, uh, capacity, I've worked with advised general managers, um, owners, or, 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 or managers, as, you, as we describe them in, in sort of the UK in terms of the Premier League, um, around this concept of you know, how do we build systemically and systematically elite performance? So I guess the principles I'm talking about stem from performance psychology, um, but I'm not, you know, I have done some work in, in terms of one-to-one -one with, with elite athletes or um, owners, CEOs, but, but principally I'm sort of stepping back and looking at 30,000 feet. How do we take it from, right, how do we even predict a potential superstar that's not a superstar yet, right through to like, right, okay, we've got this potential superstar. How do we upload the software that enables them to be effective in their performance environment? And then, and then, then further down the line onto like, right, okay, we've, we've worked so hard to achieve success. How do we sustain it and avoid being the one hit wonder? So that's, that's sort of where, where I'm looking at in that, in that respect. No, absolutely, mate. It's quite a hefty book that you've uh, put together. Um, um, what, what was the compulsion? What was, your, what was it that compelled you to write a book and fight like, within the, the very busy kind of performance sector that it's, it's placing mm. itself in? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a good question. I asked myself that question a few times during the process. Um, look, principally, you know, call me old fashioned, but, but I'm competitive myself and I want to excel in my own craft. Um, so, so there was that selfish reason in terms of, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd read a number of books by people who strongly advocate that, look, if you really want to, want to understand your own craft, then write a manifesto on how you do your business. So, so that was one thing. Um, secondly, look, the information is no good in my head. You know, and I, I love this subject. I think, you know, everyone I meet, I'm like, why the hell doesn't everyone want to study this? And I can't understand that sort of the principles sort of discussed in the book and I work within my role aren't practiced by more people in more organizations at all levels. Um, so, so part of it to me is what is an aim to democratize access to this information that at the moment is kind of reserved for those who have the budget to pay for it. Um, so, so I think that that is a sincere um, uh, ambition of mine with this book, you know, 
the fact is that if, if more people are practicing these principles to overcome uh, performance challenges in, in, in areas that are important to them, then, you know, what we do is we shift the baseline for everyone, you know, whether that's people using them to, whatever it is that's important to you, whether that's the environment, uh, you know, passing selection or, or performing as an athlete, a CEO, a mum, dad, you know, whatever. Third thing I'll say, guys, <laughs> I have to get this one across because is that I, I was a bit sick and tired as well of the personal development space in terms of books. I think too many of the, this, there's, there's so much great stuff out there, but there was a big gap, I think, in terms of people that have actually studied performance science um, and, and communicating those principles. There's a lot of um, expert performers giving their take on their unique experience, which of course is import, important, but that comes with some limitations as well. Um, and then I think there's also a lot of um, journalists writing books on human performance. And I think the problem is that journalists obviously sort of tend to die for the big attention grabbing headlines. They do a superficial skim of the information and they don't have the, I guess something we might talk about later, but the advanced mental structures for that specific area. So they sometimes miss things and, and it can cause problems down the line for the people that their, their work should serve. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything you say. Um, going back a couple of sentences you were talking about having these in your mind and it's kind of you know that's that's great and you, you this knowledge but there's something about giving back and getting it down on paper and look if uh, I'm sure that if people read it that they'll they'll be able to understand these these principles these concepts that you talk about and be able to apply them in life and ultimately have a, a benefit to what they do you know everyone's always a lot of people now modern society are trying to ring out more of what they do you know i work quite a lot with uh, quite a lot of high performing corporate teams uh, more and more so and how they manage themselves how they uh, operate you know we're talking you know I i'd use the term corporate athlete quite a lot in the sense of you know the the performance athlete that we all know from the tv recently watching the olympics you know it's very clear to us and they live a very disciplined lifestyle to get the achievements that they want in the corporate space, things are very different. And I think there's a lot to be learned from the performance world, performance science. And I know you've got a background in that, but then yourself, I think what's really nice about it is how you haven't just got that academia. You've applied yourself into uh, the sporting world, great success in the corporate world. And I think that's where people can really learn because to me, it seems like this real nice dovetailing of uh, both uh, academia and experiential. Is that, does that sound about right to you? Absolutely. And, and I think, to be honest, it, it's the best thing that happened to me is that, and I think it's partly me expressing my nature and where I'm optimised uh, as a performer myself, but I, I've, I've, um, I've spent a lot of time putting the, putting the practice to work, you know, and I've been in roles where I've been the CEO of, of big companies applying this. And, and for me, if you're a CEO or you're a leader in your organisation, then you're de facto a performance guy you know because that's what you're there to do you're there to lead people towards an objective and you know to overcome the adversity that impedes you uh, achieving that objective and, and i think that ultimately is a performance task if you define performance it is defined well i would define performance as the accomplishment of a given task measured against completeness cost and speed and that whether you're a leader in um, sf uh, in um a trading floor or, or in a sports team, that's your job. You need to get people from A to B, whatever B might be, um, as completely as possible. And completeness is sort of almost where we traditionally focus in terms of performance. So, so for example, you know, uh, a perfect 10 in gymnastics is better than a, a nine. That's a more complete performance. And that's where we, we obsess. Um, but then there's that cost. So what's the cost of getting there? Can we get person A or team B to uh, achieve the objective with half the dose, with half the time, effort, money. If we can, again, we've, in, we've improved performance. It's another really important area to focus on. And then of course, there's that speed element. And that, that requires that, well, how quickly can we get from A to B? And, and can we repeat that performance on demand, under pressure? Um, so, so yeah, it, it, that experiential part, I think is, um, it, it, it's such a shame, I think, that at the moment in human performance, you've, there's this big divide where, you've got these incredible leaders and then you've got these academics and they sort of don't speak. And I think that link, and that's something that I think I've tried to, um, I think it's a gap that I haven't consciously tried to fill, but I think by virtue of my experience, having 
had an acad academic background in, in, in the area, but then and, and maintained that in terms of my reading and, and, and charter ships so on and so forth. Um, but, but actually being out uh, sort of in the field metaphorically with these different organizations, it's made me see, ah, okay, that's a nice idea, but tell that to this guy now. You know, you you, you, you know, you'll know what it feels like to be in situations where, you know, you, 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 you know, those pants shitty moments, you tell someone to take three deep breaths, it's like, well, come on, like, you know, the problems start way before that. And I think it's given me this really high definition um, conviction in my ability to sort of pick the right tools at the right times and in the right dose for the, for the organisations and individuals I serve. I love that high def definition view. Um, you speak a lot about process. And I think, again, my experience is um, one of the things I guess that my career gave me was real clear objectives. We called them missions and we had to create a process to success. And again, by the nature of being in that role for decades, I got quite well practiced at that and, you know, was able to, you know, uh, bang heads and, and, share collaborate on those missions with great minds doing the very similar and you know when I, I hear you speak you, you you're very clear that you see that you've got to create these processes because sometimes as you mentioned just the, the problems start way before the catastrophe yeah. right the the, cata the wheels are falling it's off something that's fucked up way earlier in the process and Absolutely. So are you, a, are you, would you say that that's always been something you've been able to do or is this something that de you've developed this skill? Well, I'd say it's a combination of both. I've been, I've been privileged, privileged enough to have a great education at a great university who, where people like the likes of Dave Collins have spent time and the rest of the staff there have spent time working this stuff out. And I've had the privilege to turn up, download a lot of it, but then, then, yeah, I have, I feel like I've, um, I've then done what not many people in that space have done in terms of actually building the relationships required and actually entering those specific performance environments, building the relationships to actually, and then, and then the, here's the hard bit, guys, like actually getting people, convincing people to try this, this new shit out, right? Um, you know, I, I'm just turned 36 and, you know, I'm thinking 22, 23 years old, even if you go back then it doesn't sound that long, really, 10, 15 years. But if you look at 10, 15 years ago in terms of like human performance, that since then, it's almost been a like, like computers in the 2000s. Like it's got, gone sort of exponential with the likes of Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan, sort of starting to interview experts. And, you know, it's now it's now it's sort of fashionable to be um, working on your personal development and so on and so forth, whereas it wasn't, you know, you'll know like in the military, it certainly wasn't there. It was like you you read it out, you grizz it out, you get it done. It, and, and if you're taking supplements, it's a little bit, if that guy has, has the gels, it's a little bit like, you know, I did it on baked beans sort of thing. Yeah. And it was the same in the corporate world. It was like hard work, determination, discipline, willpower. That's it. But trying to sort of, I think the hardest bit I had was a sales pitch behind, look, there's a methodology you can apply here that makes it way easier. So that, yeah, of course, high performance, you're always going to have to grizz it out and reg it here and there. But, you know, there for the emergencies. Yeah, yeah. There's an there's an intelligent way to line up initially, right? Again, the going back to you can call upon should you require, but absolutely, you know, you don't have to nuke everything. You know, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Why not? And then again, I've I've got an experience where, you know, a colleague of yours came in, uh, and I'd imagine my old organisation is probably one of the toughest audiences in the world to initially get trust, right? Because you've got a load of tattooed broken nose alpha males on the face of it um again there's some you know there's a broad range of characters but certainly on the face of it i'd imagine that's the expectation that you're going into and, and are met with when you first turn up um day one and you know I, I, my experience was that um all of a sudden asking us questions that no one had ever asked us before and one of the questions that i got asked was you know guys what are you thinking about on the back of the helicopter when you're going to wherever it was whatever dangerous mission we were going yeah. to no one had ever asked me that before and I had that epiphany of, wow, that's a great question. I need to think about this. But two, I'd also had that moment where I was like, well, I've never shared this before with the people that yeah. I care about that are alongside me as one of the more senior people. Why haven't I shared and compared notes? And it's people such as yourself that are coming in with both the, uh, the frameworks, the structures and say, look, this is, these are the tools that are available for these kind of events. And 
let's talk about how we can apply them in your world so that you can all perform better, manage everything so much better. I always felt quite bad when someone new came into the room. I was thirsty for this, the lessons that we were about to learn. I was always there with a notebook and scribbling away like a bit of a spotter. I love all this. And so what I, I, I'm worried of how as a group we were perceived. Um, my own experiences, again, I work uh, quite closely with CT SFO police organizations. And uh, again, five minutes in you've broken the ice and they're, they're thirsty because of their situation their, their high performing world is that well it is sometimes life or death and so everything that they can extract from people of experience and again mine is a, a kind of more lived experience and this is what worked for me um you know, with tiny little bit of science i guess but yours yours is that much more blended approach so i'm really pleased that that's uh, how it came across you have to be realistic in terms of human performance and affecting change. I always like use the term radicalization, Like you almost need to radicalize the right people with the right people. You know, if you can identify, and that's certainly always been my approach. My aim is always to identify the cultural architects within, you know, the team, the squadron, and then spend your time there. And it has a trickle effect oh, uh, really over so. time. And if you back your principles and you can get a couple of people to engage in them, then ultimately you'll have that smoking gun because people will start to see the difference in terms of results, performance, or whatever uh, intervention you're, you, you've put in place to achieve. Absolutely. Like you mentioned it, the ethos of special forces is that unrelenting pursuit of excellence. To get that, there needs to be this willingness to adapt to the new ground, you know, the new truth, right? And mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the enemy, so to speak, is always going to be adapting. So you know, you should be prepared too. That's kind of in 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 its lifeblood. Um, and where are we developing every angle of this? Well, science is one of those things, and being up to date with the current readings, being up to date with the current uh, findings is absolutely critical. So, you know, I, this is you know uh, an absolute need, and it's something that you know I, I try and help uh, other organisations, businesses with myself. And I said I see it. Uh, uh, myself with sport an awful lot what what fascinates me always there's um I experienced this just last week with uh, one of the, the big Premier League clubs and um, they'll have 10 strength and conditioning coaches and maybe one performance psychologist maybe two at, at best you know there's there's a there's this real imbalance in that I mean again yeah. I'm just at sh shooting from the hip here James but you know have you got any thoughts on that and why again uh, let me just sort of close that question because my experience of people being successful in my old world was this was the thing that we needed to get right and aligned whereas these biceps probably less important in the grand scheme of things obviously there's a baseline that we need to be at but in the grand scheme of things less important than getting this so why do you think that there's that's such an imbalance in sport in particular well i think i think sport especially premier league it is at the forefront with, if you look at the classic strength and conditioning and sport psychologists in terms of leveraging those sets of expertise. Now, my opinion is that there was that initial hypothesis people had that, oh, if we can be bigger, faster, stronger, then we'll just run over people, so on and so forth. Um, so, so it sort of makes sense. And I think that's where the boom with SNC. I think also there's no shortage of lads that like love training and go and study in it. So there's, a, I think there's, there's more students of strength and conditioning than there are sports psychology. It's a, most people would study sports science and then even then they'd move towards the strength and conditioning end of the continuum. There's definitely less opportunities in terms of roles. Yep. So when you're making that point about, oh, do I do go and go down this avenue or that one? Well, there's less roles to apply for in, in the sports psychology space. I also think that um, where change is coming is that I think people are accepting now that, look, the job of the strength and conditioning coach is no longer bigger, faster, stronger. It's keep him on the pitch so he can develop this. Because this isn't just about like, oh, the mindset. Mindset's one part of it, and that's important. But let's be honest, by the time you work with someone who's, you know, working at an elite level, in whether that's the military or, or in, in sport, the mindset's there, you know? It's more like, okay, let's keep that plate spinning because they've, they've got the hardware required there, otherwise they wouldn't be in the, they wouldn't be in the room with you. The, the other things that people neglect and I think are slowly starting to get more attention and there's things I'm trying to be, it's a big part for me in the book, is this, 
look, it's we don't just want bigger, faster, stronger. Elite performance is not about um, the, the physical skills. Of course, they come into it, but really, it's kind of minimum thresholds. But if I asked you to think of like the hairy situation you've been in, guys, in your career, um, and you, you know, or imagine the worst case scenario um, you, you're, you're about to sort of go into, and you can pick two or three people that you've worked with over your entire career, and, and you can pick them to be with you. My guess is that you're not going to pick the person with the biggest back score or the quickest fran time or the best bleep test score. You're going to pick if we the people you pick. I bet if we were to break them down, you 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 want the best problem solvers. You want the best. You know, we heard the word like the best shooter. You want the the guy who can perceive the room, the best, the quickest. The guy who can anticipate what's going to happen, attend to the right information, can recognise patterns, problem solve to solutions, and these are all psychological skills that need to be factored in. Um, and I think because ultimately they're invisible, we still almost think that, oh, Lionel, Lionel Messi is so quick as an athlete. He's like, he hasn't got quicker reflexes than other players that he's playing against. He's got a quicker brain. He processes the information because he's got better perceiving skills and better decision-making skills. So he's one step ahead, but he's anticipating things that other the defenders aren't. So it looks, when you're watching him play, like he's got faster reflexes, but he hasn't. He's actually just a, a better perceiver and a, and a faster decision maker. So that, that, that he makes the game move quicker. And that's yeah. the same in all performance environments. Absolutely. It's, it's those, he's got more mental models, hasn't he? And so we, he's mapped more models onto his environment and then <laughs> he's got more experiences. I, I talk with people time and time again this experiences times a thousand makes you more experienced there's there's no shortcut to that experienced yeah apart from these experiences in the right environment and again we the, that can be optimized absolutely i'm, I'm, I'm kind of well absolutely aware. and this is it like this is where for me i know one, one of the things we've talked about uh, is the ten thousand hours rule like yes it's important you need that experience but it, it, you know that's a flawed study for one um it, it, in that it was you're looking at 14 performers in one specific area where the what one of the individuals ex, reached excellence in, in 2700 hours one took 28 and a half thousand hours i think the mean average was 11 and a half thousand hours you know um in reality what what human performance as a science does is actually go hey let's look at the individual that did it in 2700 hours and let's break down the causal mechanisms that enabled them to do it four, five, ten times faster than these other experts, you know. And, and, and when we do that, when it comes to skill acquisition and this ability to perceive and see your craft in high definition faster than the, 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 the enemy, the competition, that stems from not the time spent training, but the time spent training under some very specific conditions. And there's, 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 there's about seven, and, and it's like the more time you spend under those conditions, the greater a perceiver you're going to be, the, the faster a decision maker you're going to be, and, and you'll still maintain that again. Slick, slick execution skills are obviously important. Yeah, um, you, uh, and, you know, I, I implore people to, to get stuck into the book because they're, they're, they're fascinating. And again, as a man, you know, myself that's thought about this an awful lot, you know, you, you open my mind again to sort of some, some novel concepts and I absolutely love it again and not necessarily a novel concept but a word that you use throughout the book I've, I've never seen the word used quite so much um, um, you know is a word concordance uh, it wasn't one that was fr like regularly uh, appearing in my vocabulary but you know it is more so now be thankfully because of you because I, I buy into it so much again do you the people that maybe don't understand concordance because again optimizing people's experiences will be them being in concordance with what they're trying to achieve. But can you yeah. elaborate somewhat? Look, like, look, we, we, we know what it takes to excel, what drives elite performance, the scientific forces driving that process. Um, we know how to break that process down into its component parts and bring individuals or organizations into alignment with it. Now, concordance, like, you know, it's the one mechanism that, that all elite performers have aligned with more than anything else. Like nothing comes before this in terms of trying to build excellence. Um, it, it's born out of what we call self-determination theory in sports psychology, but in essence, it's this. Um, just like a tennis racket has a location at which the ball will rebound away from the racket, 
at a greater velocity than if struck at any other point, so do you. Um, and you perform from your sweet spot when the goals that you pursue and the way that you pursue them aligns with the qualities that make you unique. So what happens is when you perform from this sweet spot, you gain complete access to your, what we call your, I like the, I, I use the term psychological firepower. So what I mean there is your confidence, motivation, resilience. These are all part of like a, a predatory circuitry in our brain. And they all flow from the, all these emotions, they all flow from the same, same part of our brain. And, um, you know, when you perform from your sweet spot, you're driven by, the, that's the default, you're, you're driven by internal compulsion to be confident, be motivated, be resilient. There aren't people that um, lack resilience or, or motivation or confidence. There are just people pursuing goals that fail to ignite those traits in the first place. Um, that resilience isn't a fixed entity or a gene. Um, it's something that you can achieve a lot more of and you do so by, by pursuing concordant goals. So there's, there's three key areas. So, so your strengths, your interests and your values. So when the goals leverage your unique strengths and you, you, the goal is in an area that's of sincere interest to you and the rewards for achieving the goal align with your values, that's when you're banging your sweet spot. Um, I, I don't, would it be useful if I break down each of those components? Mate, please do, please do. Cool. This is fascinating, yep. So like, to me, guys, this is everything. If you're not mastering this, then just forget all the other stuff because nothing comes at the expense of getting this right. Um, so strengths, what we're talking about there is that we have this nature-nurture debate. It's both, and there's no geneticist, sports scientist, anyone with a brain would argue you, you need both. And in terms of your unique hardware, you need to pursue goals where your strengths are a weakness, and your weaknesses don't matter. Um, then the reason this is so important is that strengths dictate how responsive to training you'll be. So if Gaz, say for instance, you've got strengths in a specific area, maybe you've got higher VO2 max than me as a baseline from a genetic uh, set point, or you've got, you know, your hip to knee ratios, you've got an extra foot on me, uh, and we're, we're, we're trying to pursue the same goal in rowing. The reality is you're going to be more responsive to training. You're going to have more breakthrough moments than me. And if you have two breakthrough moments, a training cycle, and I have one, over five or six training cycles, you're going to be so far ahead of me that I'm never going to catch you up no matter how hard I try or how ambitious I am. Um, so, so we really need to make sure that we identify our unique strength, strengths. And in probably in three specific areas, so we've got, uh, obviously there's the obvious physical strengths and that's relevant, obviously, if you're an athlete or an operator. Um, but then of course there's the cognitive strengths. So uh, maybe your pattern recognition is great or you're really good with words or your, your, your numbers, you can just do them in your head, whatever it might be. There's all sorts of different, we have a cognitive anthropometry, just like we have a physical anthropometry. And you know, you, if you don't have a baseline VO2 max over say, 60 65 and you've got, got a hit to knee ratio over i don't know what it might be exactly but a really big one then you're not going to win a gold medal in rowing uh, you know so so these are like the non-negotiable hardware requirements that qualify you for success in the craft so yeah. it's really important to identify where you are on there and, and then, then uh, may, maybe not of interest to you but i'm going to throw it out there anyway i'm, I'm quite high on the ape index uh, if you feel it so my my arm length to height yeah. ratio yeah yeah very similar to not quite as significant as phelps um who did pretty yeah. well at swimming so like well there you go climbing sparring with the jab rather than uh, i'm never going to be a press up world champion i'm never going to hold the world record for bench press right so i yeah. can kind of live with that so and you know and things, it's understanding these things know thyself is is what i help people to do yeah absolutely guys and just like physically we've got the same cognitively you need to sort of spend the time to break that down and really know yourself and then to your own self be true yep. and this is this is uh where i think so many of us skip this and in leadership and, and you know one of the things i'm sure this is sort of questions you'll ask with the people you work with but it's like if you're managing a team do you, what are the strengths of the individuals in that team and you, if you want to set people up for success then get them to pursue, pursue goals where they're aligned with their strengths the, the second key thing, though, is, is interest. So um, interests are things we're instinctually drawn to. They're instincts. The thing that drives our interest literally sits at the same part of our brain as thirst and hunger. 
So like you have a third, like whether it's like motorbikes or, or the military, I know you've talked about as a young guy, like you're drawn to it. It's, you, you can't explain why. You don't get to pick your interests. They pick you. Um, and the reason interests are so powerful is that they dictate your ability to invest time in a consistent, specific direction, which is obviously critical if you're going to achieve any goal. And that's why you've got to be honest with yourself and be like, look, sit back, reflect, be like, what am I sincerely interested in here? And that could be more broadly in terms of like a graduate thinking, where do I start my career? Am I interested in the military or in finance or in sport? Or, But also to very specifically, whether you're working with a top NFL player, like what are my interests on the pitch? Or, or, or whether, you know, what do I enjoy doing? Where am I drawn to? Um, or in a squadron, what, what are things that I just enjoy that other people don't? And how do I do more of that? Because if I spend more time in that area, I'm going to access more of this psychological firepower. Um, and the key thing with interest is like you don't need to motivate a child to play like it's as simple as that and when we're interested in things we almost want to break them down and build them back up again and, and it's irrational and, and, and that's you know the, the evolutionary purpose of our interest is to guide us uh, along our path of maximal development so it's really important to spend the time reflecting on these things have you got uh, any kind of you know i we talk about self-reflection all the time um to increase your self-awareness as well. But again, have you got any kind of, with regards to people finding that sweet spot, you know, and those, and those particular strengths as to how they can focus their attention on that rather than just sitting there. Again, I had someone message me the other day, guys, how, you know, how do you do go about doing your gratitude journaling? You know, it's like, well, you know. How do I actually do it? Yeah, how, you know, what's the, what's, what can you help people with understanding, you know, how can they focus their attention on that sweet spot to even understand where, where it might be? Yeah, well, well, obviously in the book, there's a ton of questions and I'm happy to send them over to you guys. Obviously there's quite a few, maybe if people are interested in this, you could, is that, you could post them up so there's some reflective questions people can. Yeah, I'd, I'd tell can everyone, them. I'd tell everyone to buy the book. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's also links in there that I'll also send across though, um, Look, there's online, um, in terms of strengths, there's online cognitive uh, assessments you can do that will say where you are in the normal distribution curve in terms of, wow, you're really good with numbers or you're slow with words and you're, you know, you know, it'll give you a mapping of like a heat map of where you seem to excel. And, and again, you don't have to be, when I say strengths, I don't mean you have to be like the fastest kid in your class, but I mean like you have to be, if you want to be a uh, pursue a goal where speed's really important, you kind of want to be to the right end of that you know um then there's some personality we have personality strengths as well so that's going to affect where you're optimized and there, there's a ton of a great free personality t tests online that i can send you the links to that people can can engage in um with interest i think it's best to do the reflective questions that i can send across um and, and it's the answers are already there they're influencing what you are doing now the fact the the individual with you know we're having this conversation with is listening to this podcast is a clue in itself um, and, and it's like where do you spend your time if i came in your house now and i looked at the books on your bookshelves and then i looked at the ones you actually read what are they what podcasts you actually listen to which ones have you listened to a couple of times what's unique about those what are the themes um who do you hang around with what's unique about them who are your heroes what what why are your heroes what inspires you about those individuals there's tons of these questions we just need to take the time to reflect um, and then what's really important is that, look, it's once you've identified a strength or once you've identified an area of interest, just move towards it. It's not about, uh, it's, concordance is certainly not a game of perfect. You'll drive yourself crazy if you try and, you know, where's my like, hit the nail on the head sweet spot. It's something that moves and it's something that you zero in on and um, you'll get clues. And, and as you move closer to it, you'll get more psychological firepower, you'll get more confidence, you'll get more learnings, you'll try things on. You might realize, well, actually, shit, I thought it might have been it, but that's definitely not. And it, and it guides you back on track. Um, you just need to listen to that sort of, that, that intuition. But the questions can certainly be useful. Uh, I was just going to say, just as uh, I'm actually stood right next to my uh, bookshelf right now. Um, and it's funny, I was talking about the 10,000 hour rule. You know, this is Anders Ericsson's peak, um, uh, the, the, the father of the 10,000 hour rule study, really. And, and yeah. you, you know, you haven't so much debunked what he, what he wrote about um, or studied and, and reported. It's more like, let's, let's distill that down. And, and, you know, yes, 
anyone with success in their field, they haven't got there by chance, right? They're, they're there because there's a considerable amount of time and effort put into this. And, you know, there's a considerable amount of time and effort, but it's way more confident, complex than just time. And I've got to be honest, like, to me, if it took me as a performance expert or as a partner in the businesses and organizations I've been in, if it took me 10,000 hours to sort of manufacture a world-class performer, I'd be out of job. Like, I've seen, like, from my own experience, I've seen guys go from zero straight civvy to special force super soldier in way less. I've seen guys from straight civvy to hedge fund manager in way less. I've seen athletes in less than four years go from nothing to Olympian, you know? It's, it, it really is about the extent to which you align with a few key fundamental principles. Yes, time's obviously going to be one of them, but it's more like, uh, I mean, for instance, one of the principles is that you talk about in terms of talent development and skill acquisition or the acquisition of expertise would be time you spend in the adaptive zone. So the adaptive zone, like when you impose demands on yourself or those you care for, manage or lead, that exceed their capacity, you create a performance gap. Now, that gap is the catalyst that sparks your genetics to adapt to a superior level. Now, the more time you spend in the adaptive zone, the more responsive you're going to be to training. So if you're doing three hours training, but you're thinking about how many swipes you got on Tinder or Grindr at the weekend, or what you're going to have for dinner, or daydreaming, looking at the cloud that looks like the shape of a cow or something, you're not getting better. So it's, it's the time spent in the adaptive zone. And in the adaptive zone, you know, you should be sort of hands clasped, pupils dilating, eyebrows squished together, your forehead furrows, you like, you feel your heart pound, your mind churn, your, you, you, you know, anything puts something in front of your hand, your eyes should burn holes through it. That's the adaptive zone. And it's time spent there that matters most, not just time spent at the gym or time spent in the environment. Um, and that's that's one of the one of the examples that will again accelerate your, your pursuit. I, I, I love that. You know, again, I I think uh, psychologist Bardwick spoke about the the stretch zone. Uh, and again, but it's it's finding those areas and those interests that you've got where nothing else matters, right? Stephen Co he talks about flow, uh, and this yeah. is the same the same thing, but it's it's finding your way to be in that space with the intention of you know, personal development or growth in your particular field, whatever that field might be. Um, it's challenging to do that. And these, you mentioned the kind of furrowed brow, the focus, the attention that's required. Also within that, um, you know, and again, my own experiences, one of the things that challenged me, continues to challenge me when I'm in those particular spaces. Sometimes it's with the kids, sometimes it's with work, sometimes it's with colleagues that I'm working with. Um, is that emotional control. And there's an amazing chapter or a couple of uh, chapters in the book where you go in, you go quite a deep dive into emotional control. And um, some of the information or books I've read in the past, Professor Steve Peters talks a lot about um, a different color head, red headed and blue headed. And, and you kind of elaborate and you develop that. Do you mind kind of covering a little bit on that, you know, on on a, the four color, the four color head model that you, you talk about in the book? Sure. Like, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Ultimately, you can, you can, you can pick concordant goals and you can expose yourself to the right training conditions, but then it's time to compete on demand, under pressure. You need to be able to access all the technical ability you've got in your tank. Um, and as a, if you, if you think of the traditional performance psychologist, for me also, I would label it as a, a CO, uh, an, an RSM, a Sergeant Major, like any leader, a captain of a sports team, the manager of that sports team, there's three primary responsibilities and this model sort of demonstrates them. So there's almost four performance zones you can find yourself in at any point in time. But when it's time to compete and train, there's only one that's optimal for performance. And that's what I describe as blue head or blue zone. So in this zone, you've got high output of attention and it's laser like focus on the task at hand. And the emotions you experience are really positive. So adjectives that might describe how you feel in here might be confident, aligned. One, one performer I worked with, pretty damn elite, said, I feel like a god in here. And in this zone, this is the stuff we all dream about. This is what Kotler will talk about. This is what he means. He's talking about flow state. So flows are defined as a harmonious experience where mind and body become one and the task just becomes effortless. You lose track of time and sensation and you just... You just deliver. 
It's for like Ben Stokes, the, the ball coming at him is in slow motion like a beach ball and he just wallops it out of the park. Um, you know, it's like Michael Phelps feels like he's plugged into a nuclear reactor. Um, this, this is the states that you experience in flow and there's a chemical um, symphony going on here of indestructibility and your brain releases the big six. So we've got anandamide, uh, norepinephrine, serotonin, oxytocin, um, dopamine and serotonin all release on they come online the right sequence right time and it's like taking the limitless pill you know um, so characteristics that describe people in this involved it, it, you know all that stuff you need to do all that performance or the level you've demonstrated historically can be accessed on demand under pressure you're plugged into your unconscious your mind it just takes over and it just gets the job done and and, and that's that's the first aim for any leader, right? When it's time to compete or train, I want the athletes, the operators, bang, top right of that, that deep, dark blue. I want that tension, laser-like on task at hand. I want it feeling good and leveraging all those benefits. Um, then, of course, so you're in your performance environment going along, and then, you know, whether it's a bad refereeing decision, uh, your partner giving you grief, the news, it could be a million and one things, but something can happen in your environment and it can just shunt you into what I'd call the red zone. So here, you've still got a high output of attention, it's still focused on the task at hand, but now there's some negative emotion here. So frustration, you just have got the ump, you're angry, bored, these sorts of things can, can kick off. That could be like, um, you know, you can still perform in here, but there's some side effects now. For starters, your blood flow, diverts from your unconscious brain towards your emotional brain and your conscious brain. And the risk here is that you overthink things. An elite performance is just totally unconscious. So any thinking when we go to our conscious brain risks interrupting that. And that's the classic choking we see. We've seen Rory McIlroy, you know, have some experience on the 18th hole, starts to overthink things uh, uh, and chokes. Um, we saw it, saw it with young Emma Raducanu at Wimbledon, who then just burst back like a machine to, to obviously deliver on the US Open, which was just immense. Um, it's a very real thing. It happens to all of us. There's some problems there. The first one's obviously the performance one for the reason we've just discussed. But secondly, uh, in this zone, you know, we swap out the big six. And now we're running on like the three stress hormones, so cortisol, noradrenaline, and adrenaline. And, and they can sustain performance, but there's problems uh, there. They're very inefficient, so we're going to run, run out of energy very quick. And also, like from a health perspective, cortisol is linked to almost every disease known to man. So, you know, it's not good to spend too much time in there. From a behavioral perspective as well, when you're in the red zone, you know all that stuff you know you shouldn't do, but you sometimes do? That always happens in redhead. That never happens when you're in bluehead. And it's because you're, you, you're hardwired to seek some form of instant gratification. And when we feel that negative emotion for a prolonged period with those hormones, of course, our adrenaline, that's when we order the junk food, skip rehab, don't turn up to training, you know, even alcoholism, promiscuity, all those things and those mistakes happen when we're spending time in there. So, so the second aim, I think, of leadership teams is to ID where your team or, you know, and as an individual where you are on that barometer and be like, notice when they're in that red zone, get them back, help make sure they've got strategies to get them back on track as soon as possible spend too much time in there and you're going to end up uh in what i'd call like blackhead so in, in, in this zone you've got no energy left your cortisol's just burnt through it you've got no attention to spend so it's just sort of like all over the place and you still feel negative so this is this is classic burnout and at this point um you know it's uh it's pathological. So you, your blood pressure is going to be high. You might have anxiety or depression. You might have chronic fatigue syndrome. It might manifest in another way. You need to where maybe you've got a genetics predisposed weakness with your immune system, but you can't perform in there. Uh, uh, and the first thing you need to do when you're in there is, is speak to someone. And that's obviously really important, whether that's your mate or, or reach out to someone that's really important. So I advocate whenever we sort of talk about this team and this model to, to um, to any sort of performers the thing with with burnout is it's a sneaky right it, it, like redhead you feel it like a kick in the nuts so you you know it's like, ah and you, you just you don't you do your nuts in and you sort of you know where you are blackheads creeps up you don't just work at way you, you, you don't just wake up one day burnout it's a progressive process from you know maybe just taking on too much 
um, lack of recognition for your work, pursuing uh, goals that you're not concordant with is the big one. And this is why for me, concordance comes first because forget getting into blue head if you're not pursuing concordant goals, it's not gonna happen. You just won't experience it. Also, it's a lot harder to manage your emotion, you get out of redhead if you're not, again, not pursuing concordant goals. And then subsequently, skill acquisition piece, we talk about the right type of training. If you've not technically prepared for the demands you're imposed of, then of course, you, you know, how can you expect to be in this flow state? You, you can't, it's stupid. You, you're gonna be in redhead. And part of training in the adaptive zone will be quite a lot of oscillation between red and blue head. And it's managing that balance, right? And that, that's a bit of an art. But I guess the final aim and the most important one uh, is green, green zone or green head. So here, we're expending a, a very low amount of attention. It's not focused on much at all, but we feel good. So adjectives that describe how we're feeling here would be chilled out, horizontal, relaxed, just, and we need to schedule time for that. Um, in here again, hormonally, we've got this whole different set of hormones kicking in, the recovery restorative hormones. So again, more of the serotonin, dopamine, um, a lot of similar to the big six, but without some of the norepinephrine and the alert type hormones, but also the sex hormones, the testosterone um, uh, and estrogen, these recovery repair hormones. And Greenhead's really the zone of restoration. The work you do in Bluehead, where we're exposed to challenges, whether that's cognitive skills, physical tasks, they're just a spark that ignite adaptation to take place. But the adaptation and the super compensation the growth of your skills can only occur in green zone. And this is why the recovery aspect is so important. Um, and, and it's so overlooked by, by many people. James, there's, there's, there's a ton of stuff there. I, uh, again, everyone that's just listened, uh, I implore you to rewind maybe five minutes, whatever it was, and listen to that again. Are we as simple as four different areas? No, of course not. This is a model that helps us to see when these things we're transitioning maybe from one to the other and how we can optimize what we're doing. Again, my experience is one of the biggest things that you've just said at the end there that people, whether they're the very top of their game in law firms, whether they're the very top of their game in sport, is finding time for this green zone, this green yeah. head where they can really invest back in themselves to be ready the following moment, the following uh, event, the following mission in my own world to be able to get into the blue zone. People are burnt out because they're not focusing time on this um, and even understanding what they can do in this space. I mean, again, from your experiences, James, you know, how are you helping people to, or how have you seen the best ways of helping people to, to transition from, this blue, blue, red, or black into this green, this green zone. So again, it starts with taking the time to reflect and it starts with some personal leadership. If you're, if you're working as an individual, like, look, it's on you. It's your future. It's your responsibility. You take the lead of it all, right? Like you can't rely on your manager to schedule your green zone. I, I wish you could. And if I was speaking to them, then I'd certainly try and help out there. But I guess in this conversation, we're speaking to individuals on a podcast and it's like, Take ownership of it. It's not rocket science. Stop making excuses. You need to sit down. You can draw this four zone thing out. You'd be like, what, what things, when have I felt those emotions described in blue hair? What was I doing? Who was I with? What was unique about those moments? And then try and manufacture more of that in your environment. Same with redhead. What things, what people consistently drag me into red zone? Is it always that person or that news channel or take ownership of it delete it remove what you can um with with blackhead it, for me it's more about just make sure you've got a couple of people around you or someone that you, you you can speak to if you're in there because sometimes it's hard to get your way out there it's really easy the the, the, the solution the antidote is to just green zone and your body will rebalance um the symptoms that, that send you there however it's sometimes difficult to spot that but um you know, characteristics of being in there are like, you know, you're losing, so for instance, Gaz, you know, you, there might, there'll be periods where perhaps throughout your career, you've been like, look, you're, you're highly concordant by the virtue of what you achieved in your career as an SF operator. But I've no doubt there are moments where you've, you had those like, what am I even doing this? This is stupid. That's classic symptom of burnout. You fall out of love with a thing you've been in love with your whole life. And it can, you can even, I'm not a, classic, I'm not a relationship expert, but it's the same principle. It's like, 
And it's because you burn out and you need some recovery and it's, and you just need to reverse those symptoms. But, but, but then in terms of recovery, here's a good question. And I'd like to ask you it, because I know you're better at this now than you probably were, but like, when was the last time you scheduled time to just completely relax and detach something just for Gaz, not for your partner or your children or, or your colleagues? I, no. And again, I, you know, implore people to understand this, you know, and again, for a bit extra background on that, James, you know, you, you know, We've, we've not planned this, but I'm really clear in this because it's something I've spent some time thinking about. You know, the military, especially early days, the Marines, let's use them as an example. That was certainly my example. They teach you certain disciplines um, and they will discipline you if things don't go well and you don't do well in those areas. The difference for me is going into special forces and spending a, 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 you know, a vast majority of my career in that world. They're not looking to discipline people they're not looking for people to have to be told more than once or twice about something they want self-discipline and exactly what you've said take ownership of that it's ownership isn't it and so for, for me and again my experiences leaving the military actually I lost a lot of the structure that the job afforded me that I was probably unconscious of so being self-employed I could literally sit around in my pants all day and no one's ever going to say anything. Well, Karen, my wife would, but uh, apart from that, apart from the boss, um, she, you know, she would, no one would say anything. I, I know, but I'm, that never happened, you know, because I'd like to think that I've developed self-discipline and that self-discipline helped me to realize, firstly, quite a, you know, a, I'd say a high level I'd like to think anyway of interoception. So an understanding of what's going on inside my body. You know, I'm, I'm aware when I'm running hot, I'm aware um, because I've, I've spent many months or years there running too hot and maybe things have, you know, the wheels have started to fall off and I, I've needed to get myself into that green space to afford myself that time. Me now, uh, James, I um, Friday afternoons from a lifetime in the military, I was always traving home. So Yes. If I was in the UK, so that time was always spent frustratingly in a car, um, wishing I could get home sooner when I was stuck on the A34 uh, traffic jam. And so now, Friday afternoons now for me are untouchable. They're for me, you know, until the children come home from school where I get to do what I want to do. And it seems really selfish, but, you know, it's this, uh, I, I read about, uh, Patagonia, the clothing company, and they live on, they live in, Cal they're based in California, I think, and then on the West Coast, and, you know, they afford their staff um, half a day a week um, to go surfing, and, you know, people want to work for Patagonia, it's the same thing, it affords them that time, I know Google have Google time for their staff, where they um, get cut time carved out to do the things that are concordant to them, that the time that they want to do, for me, Friday afternoons and I get to do the things that I want to do and for me whether it's Pareto's principle the 80-20 rule that's enough for me to I mean there's other times through the week that I'm, I've got control over my time now which is why I do what I do but um, that is the time that I, I won't no one can touch it and unless I want them to and, and that's that's for me Absolutely. or the, for me to do the things with the people that I want to do with. And that's a, that's a brilliant example of, of putting this to work and, and I think one of the things I'd like to highlight is that Look, managing yourself around this barometer, it starts with just the ability to identify where you are on it. So don't beat yourself up if you're in the red zone. If you've identified you're in there, you're on the way to sort of growing this ability to regulate your emotions. So that's like victory. Every time you identify I'm in the red zone here or I'm running hot, like that's, that's phase one. Phase two is then looking to just, if you could just identify one small thing, again, it's not a game of perfect, like, even if it's like, look, within the constraints I've got, because there's acute and chronic green zone, like the, the chronic example might be like, right, I'm going to have a sabbatical or I'm going to have my two week holiday a year. Like I, I really like in the companies I work with, we sort of have a rule whereby every quarter you need to have a week out the office and annually you need to have two weeks. Um, and certainly on some of the training floors I've worked in, I've had to walk around and hit people with a stick to be like, go home. Like if you're not, if you're still sat there at four o'clock, you're going home because there's this, they're so concordant with their craft, they're almost addicted to it. And that's the danger of elite performance. It's very addictive. And one of the few things that can derail elite performers is this overtraining um, principle. But also, like, just look for, you can build in 
spikes of green zone throughout your day, whether it's just taking, I'm going to do 10 minutes of headspace in the morning. If you hate head meditation, don't do it. Like, do what you're concordant with in terms of green zone. If green zone for you is playing modern warfare, Call of Duty or FIFA or whatever it might be, or reading your book, just get 10 minutes of it. Get, get 10 minutes at lunchtime, but try and schedule little bouts of green head throughout the day, even if it's like you've got a particular pal at work that, you, that makes you laugh or you... You know, schedule that, meet them for lunch, go somewhere you enjoy. Like just, you've got to try and search for just one, two things. And I guarantee as soon as you do one, you'll spot the next one. It takes one little breakthrough to perceive the possibility of the next. Maybe you have to earn that opportunity. Maybe you have to go to your boss and say like, look, I'm delivering this, but in return, can I get this hour here or there for the gym or for that? And and it's a process of negotiation and, and ownership. But yeah. But these are non-negotiables. You will elite performance, and not just elite performance, the sake of having a life and quality of health alongside your achievement. You need to oscillate. The aim's got to be oscillation between blue head, green head. Blue head, when I'm competing and training, blue head. When I'm, when I'm not, I want to be in the green zone. And I even look at that through the course of a day, not just the season or the time, you know? Yeah, yeah. It was one of the things I was wondering to 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 plug you on with regards to that that performance day and, and that that arc that we can have you know we can't again we're not going to i implore people like i said to to get stuck into the book there's a ton of gold in there that um you know i i personally took took from it and we'll oh, continue we'll continue to use you know um going to start trying to wrap this up james again always conscious of time i i could sit and i'm sure we will sit in the not too distant sure. future and talk around and kick this around some more but Absolutely. um people listening you know, this is a podcast about them trying to get more out of what they're maybe doing now. Maybe they don't feel particularly concordant with what they're doing. Um, maybe they're absolutely concordant with what they're doing, but they, they feel like they've got more to give. And, you know, so what advice would you give on, on those people maybe starting to pursue that, that achieving their own excellence? Look, this is going to sound, I can't believe I'm going to say this. But it is actually, to be honest, read the book because um, there are a set of principles you can align with. And it's not a debate. They will accelerate your pursuit of excellence in your craft and shift the baseline of like the health and happiness alongside of it. And what you really need to do is you are the expert on you. And the reason I wrote this book is that I wanted it to be an operation manual rather than a, an entertaining read so that people can identify, look, you know, like you said, guys, I'm all over the concordance bit, but got my training. I'm not aligned with the right principles. That's going to be where my accelerators are. That's where I need to focus my effort. It enables you to be your own coach. That's the whole point of the book, that you'll be able to identify where are you not aligned with these principles and which ones can you come into alignment quite easily and do that. Go with the easy stuff. Um, there's not, if I had to say one thing for me, it would just be obviously the, the concordance, but it's listen to yourself, take time to reflect but you need to understand what actually drives elite performance. And until you've got that, comp, that foundational understanding, I think it's, it, it, it can be very much... One of the challenges, I think, is that the personal development space is like a charged fire hose to the face. You know, we're bombarded with promises of ease, fast, easy change, you know, whoop bands, aura rings, kale smoothies, waking up at 4 a.m., channeling you're in a Navy SEAL. I've read about lunchtime quidditch sessions of the new key to elite performance. Like, it's so confusing. And, and whilst these are all potentially great habits to form, you know, um, they're one percenters and they're marginal gains. The, the fundamental principles that will drive your pursuit of excellence are, are, are sort of way deeper than that. The con is the concept of concordance, pursuing concordant goals, aligning with the principles of best practice in terms of your training, managing yourself around the barometer, and then innovating and adapting to stay ahead of the rest and keeping a finger on the pulse with all these things. Um, yeah. No, I, I love that. Um, it, it kind of ties quite nicely into your your quote in the book. Um, one of my favourites from it, actually, that you can you can BS talking, but you can't BS doing. And a lot of what you just spoke about, um, you know, there's a lot of BS out there, right? There's an awful lot, um, and it's those people. That's probably too harsh in the sense of there's 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 truth to what these things and adjustments you can make can have on you. But we're talking the one percenters, you know, what we're talking about. And I hope people have drawn from this chat today is actually, you know, rather than focusing on the icing, we need to look at the cake. Right. And, and how do we 
uh, the, probably the worst analogy going, but how do we get to understand what are the, what's the case? And that's concordance. And, and people can uh, spend some time on those fundamental principles and really get a good look if they, if they take the book and, and have a real deep dive on it. So James, I, I really appreciate your time today. Um, have you got anything, I guess, um, last thing for anyone listening to, uh, to take away from our chat today? Yeah, I guess the last message would be to everyone is look, I think this is so important, but like excellence is not about doing extraordinary things. It's about doing ordinary things extraordinary, extraordinarily well. And it's just, you need to understand the basics, master the basics, and, and you, you have no idea what you're, you're capable of and how much potential exists within you when you come into alignment with these principles. Yeah, no, James, thanks for that. I couldn't think of a better way to, to round it off. So, uh, again, um, thank you for your time today. And uh, I look forward to uh, chatting some more. Oh, about well, it. absolute pleasure, guys. And yeah, hopefully we'll do it again soon. Cheers, man. All the best.